the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. The Sarge, the Badger. He's got a lot of nicknames. Delegate Mike Heights. Good morning, Rob. Senior member to the uh, Friday Five, Michael Carl. Good morning, everybody. Dates back to the uh, Clinton administration, I think. Like 1998, I think, right? Yeah, I right. Like yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Back when we were in the basement. Yeah. In, that the, was a, in the dungeon. That <laughs> was a desperate time for some Republicans. I'm not saying Mike, but that was a desperate. <laughs> pull, your, pull your mic down closer to your mouth there. <laughs> okay. Larry, that was actually a good time compared to now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Great to be here. And via telephone, Joe, Joey Tuts for ready. Good morning, folks. Joe, we appreciate you doing double duty this week. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, events dictated. Uh, there was some interesting news this week. I'm glad we were able to cover it. Well, uh, speaking of interesting news, it's uh, intro time. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Mike, you're up first today. As in Carl. I looked left and said, Mike, there's two of them now. Oh, that's a, that's a change. I'll, I'll get ready. <laughs> They're looking back at me in stereo over there. He made his living at the Bulls Rice Law Firm, specializing in taxes and making the IRS squirm. But he's also known as a stickler for punctuation and grammar. And on that, many junior associates felt the drop of his hammer. Even Katie Wilkes Delegetti was subjected to the Mike Carl drama when she dared to disagree with him about the use of the comma. <laughs> <laughs> you made that up, but it rhymes. Bill was here. He heard Katie. I heard, I heard Katie did that. Yep. Really? K- oh, Katie said yeah. you, that the two of you went rounds on the use of the comma <laughs> when she was younger. Doing her legal briefs, and you would review them. Uh, well, oh, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now it makes sense. Details matter. <laughs> I don't rec- I, I'm, I'm guessing the reason he wasn't remembering it is there was no consultation. There was an X through that comma. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We're not going to chat about that. Yeah. It's gone. Katie, you're wrong. You just fix that. <laughs> oh, here we go. I mean, if you're Larry Schultz, you're not suffering from boredom from the repeated failed speaker attempts by Representative Jim Jordan. Or how about that Sidney Powell guilty plea in that Georgia election case? And how it might ultimately confine Donald Trump to his own personal 12 by 12 space. Yes, Republicans are keeping up the mischief like the game Angry Birds. Larry Schultz says if you want to know who Republicans really are, well, their actions speak louder than their words. <laughs> it's a great, great morning to be here. It's a great day to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, watching the Sidney Powell thing after I had already turned in my questions was uh, somewhat anxiety-inducing. But that's okay. We'll get back to her. Mr. Height, you're up next. I tested my Mike Height Cowboys theory as he prepared to go out of town again because the last time he was around, the boys lost 42-10. to 10. It seems whenever Mike Height is in the 25401, his Cowboys lose, and that certainly ain't no fun. So away he went last week as he felt it was best to flee this scene. And what do you know? The Chargers lost to the Cowboys 20 to 17. And, and what was great about this, I was sitting right beside Michael Hornby when it happened. <laughs> but who's a Chargers fan? But this week, what does he do? Leave, stay, laugh, or cry? For it's week seven, and what do you know? The Cowboys have the bye. That means they won't lose. <laughs> <laughs> he was out a couple weeks ago, so David Valente manned his phone. But now he's back to Macaulay Culkin it. He'll be all home alone. I don't mind if Joe Ferretti misses a week now and then. Why, he wants missed a week to go golfing with Big Ben. Big Ben. Now that was a man who could toss a football. The only thing that could ever stop him was a Matt Canada play call. <laughs> Bitterness is getting deep here. Steelers fan. Good morning, Joe. No one said I was wrong, though. <laughs> no. no, every every Steeler fan's lament for sure. Just eleven days to go until Bill's favorite holiday arrives. The day his Dennis dreads, but the holiday in which he thrives with Kit Kats and Snickers and treats of every kind. His sweet tooth rules the day, but save the tricks if you don't mind. He's a big fan of Halloween, more so than his Tesla or his caddy. It's the day he tells his wife, Bonnie, just refer to me as your sugar daddy. (laughs) (laughs) She she would never buy that. (laughs) Uh, Joe, you're up first as uh, as the leadoff hitter today. Issue number one. Okay, Rob. Uh, Well, something Larry Schultz said uh, a couple shows ago, 
kind of resonated with me, and and he's so correct on this. Uh, the state's willingness and the ability to tackle this problem we have in our foster care system and in, in many other uh, of our social programs and social safety net uh, programs, I should say, are are, uh, are really a vexing problem for the state and something we really got to get serious about. As Larry indicated, this generation of young parents and these their children, uh, this generation is going to be serving us. And, in, in, you know, some of the older folks that, that we are, they're going to be in positions of, working in county government, in our schools. They're going to be our EMTs someday. We're going to be so reliant upon them. It's in our best interest to make sure that they succeed. And right now, there's a lot of concern about whether or not they're going to succeed. And and I'll, I'll cite you some very quick statistics that show what's really a deplorable state we are in here in West Virginia. In West Virginia, Placement of children into foster care is four times the national average and double that of the next highest state. Parental rights are terminated in West Virginia faster and more often than any other state. The number of children in foster care increased by 57% in the last 10 years in West Virginia, while our population decreased 4%. West Virginia places 44% more children in group homes or institutions versus the national average. And child poverty rates in West Virginia increased from 20% of families to 25% of families. And folks, we were the only state in the country to see an increase in child poverty in the year 2022. So what is going on in West Virginia and how do we address this problem? I, I, I fear that the focus is on the back end of the problem. You hear this when the legislature is down there in special session, and you hear it when our legislators come home and talk about it. We need more foster care work uh, parents. We need more child protective services employees. We need more courts. We need more judges. We need more attorneys. We've got an, a, a backlog of abuse and neglect cases that is a crisis proportions, and we've got to get more of those cases run through the system. All that I understand, but we also have to look at this problem another way. We have to get it at the front end. We have to have interdiction. And I think we have to look at ways to keep families out of crisis before children get abused, before parental rights get terminated. And the way to think about that is to go back and remember that this is a state that has severely tightened the SNAP benefits and TAMP benefits that we provide the families. That's money that they should get to keep them out of poverty and to maybe relieve some of the financial pressures that correlate directly with child abuse and child neglect. We should look at having more counseling centers that where parents can enter those centers with their children and have family counseling available. More counselors at the front end can perhaps keep families out of crisis. So I think as a legislature and as a body politic in West Virginia, we have to start looking at tackling this problem on the front end, keeping these statistics lower rather than just dealing with the problem on the back end and and, and having more people run through the system. Uh, I think that will help save this generation so that these folks can be productive and help us older folks later in life. So that's what the thinking I think we have to have. I'm sure there's going to be pushback about how much we already spend on this problem, but clearly I don't think it's enough. And I think it's how we spend the money is just as important as how much. That's my proposal. I'm I'm interested in what others think. All right, let's go to the House of Delegates first and Delegate Michael Height. Well, interestingly enough, I just listened to a a report on this um, during interims this past weekend. Um, The the new incoming uh, Human Services Secretary um, was addressing this and um, was coming up with solutions uh, much like what you have just proposed, Joe, that um, they agree that this needs to be tackled um, on the front end. Um, that it needs to be looked at where we need to keep um, kids with their families as much as possible and stop taking them out of the family setting. Um, 
Right now, uh, you know, we roughly have somewhere around 6,000 plus uh, kids that are that are in the system, the state system. Um, 58% of them are are with what they call kinship care, um, whether it's uh, their their parents or, or some some family member is the ones that are caring for them and they're getting benefits to take care of them. Um, so and and the actual foster care system only has about 27% of them. So I think there's a concerted effort to do some of the things you're talking about, um, but it's one of those things where I think the state and the Department of Health, um, even the legislature has been caught off guard by the rising numbers of children um, in the system, per se. Uh, a lot of that having to do with <clears throat> the opioid addiction issues within the state um, and I think it just rose faster than uh, DHHR and the legislature could uh, make corrections and you know I've spoken before about the answer to these issues isn't always money you just can't throw money at a problem and then hope it goes away there have to be solutions and, and solutions a lot like what you've just laid out uh, Joe, and I think the state is doing that now. They're they're a little bit behind the eight ball doing it. They've waited way too long, but I have seen a concerted effort here in recent months to address these issues and get a handle on it and do a lot of the things that you just mentioned. Mike Carl. <clears throat> well, I, I, I agree with everything I've heard so far, uh, but I, uh, I still think it, it, and it shocks me that, you know, those statistics about how bad the situation has become in West Virginia. Um, and I think part of the, the, my focus would be to improve the the whole, you know, economic environment of West Virginia. Uh, and then the this is this this problem is one of the manifestations of the, you know, the poor economic environment. And so, you know, the. The big picture is to me to to you know reform the tax structure and all that, Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, the a problem of using statistics is that you're looking backward, and and we don't really know what changes have been made uh, during that process. So you look backward, you develop a, a base. But I give the legislators a lot of credit. They have taken this problem on. Uh, they looked hard at DHHR uh, along with the governor. They came up with a report. They've actually implemented some of the, the, uh, the policies. They reorganized DHHR. The key to me is the people they have leading in the three departments. Uh, if they're good people, I think some of the issues that Joe Ferretti have raised will be addressed, not overnight, but they're going to be addressed in time. If they have less good people, we're just going to see a manifestation of what we have in the past. Uh, I think it's too early to say the, whether the legislators have d done the right thing or not. I'm hopeful that, ha I'm hopeful that they have. Uh, I'm optimistic they have. Uh, but most things you have to look at the problem from a holistic aspect as opposed to just segments of it and and I, if if we still see statistics like we have last several years then we need to take another approach looking at it from a pure holistic aspect mr schultz um partly i come to this with some ignorance uh, regarding the facts um we we had an opioid crisis that's still ongoing today huge pharmaceutical concerns made tons of money uh peddling um uh, peddling addictive substances all through the state we sued them there was a giant settlement where is that money in other words did we just put it in the is it part of the surplus that we're dealing with now i think it hasn't arrived yet well there's that and, and i'm not sure where that goes and who determines the how it's used I, i'm pretty sure there's some kind of well, that's the board the governor board, appointed and yeah right, right that determines how that money gets spent it doesn't go into general revenue okay. where the legislature would decide and it has to go to um programs that address the opioid crisis and not necessarily to programs like like the the issues that it's caused like uh, you know the foster care system right at, 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 a local, at a local level i think uh most of it is directed toward the local level yes 
Uh, so uh, one of the issues then is we had a lawsuit because this wrong was visited upon us. We got a recovery, and we're not clear even I, – I was not – I was kind of shocked to hear that it hadn't been paid yet. Um, you know, in, in what I do for a living, <laughs> they don't get a release until they pay. Um, and we, we could open it back up. Um, but the main problem caused by the opioid crisis is the destruction of the West Virginia family. That is the thing that makes us number one in a lot of these things, that we have so much uh, destruction of our families that have gone on. And as a personal injury attorney, for years I watched clients of mine who got, you know, serious but but relatively short-term spine and, and, and um, back problems or other muscular problems that were causing a lot of pain, and they were loaded up with these pills. And I've spoken to some of the folks from years ago who said the car wreck was nothing. It was getting rid of those pills that messed my life up. <laughs> and we we still have a, a terrible problem with that here. You know, Larry, you mentioned that you were surprised that it has not been paid yet. I'm thankful it has not been paid yet because we do not want to fall in the same category we had with COVID, this tremendous amount of money being just distributed without a game plan. What they put into place uh, as some uh, couple of so committees that are looking at that. We have Matt Harvey is on one of them, uh, head of community service on another one. Uh, these folks are, I think, most appropriately looking at the best utilization of these dollars. I would hope they do the homework first before we start distributing the money. So I've, got, I've received numerous texts on this, and there's several uh, mentions on our Facebook page about the West Virginia First Foundation, and that's the foundation that Matt Harvey was appointed to by the governor. That's the foundation that will determine how these funds are distributed around the state, and they are community direct. Bill, yeah, of course, that yeah. is accurate. And yeah. uh, whether or not that first tranche of money has arrived or not, I can't verify, but I know that it won't get spent until they develop the guidelines for how it's going to be distributed. And that's the purpose of the foundation in part. And again, on that, I think one of the wisdoms of the American First and others is that the uh, decision making in part is being directed from the from the local level with folks like matt harvey and some of the others own they're looking at it from the local needs and not from a charleston need. well yeah, they, they, when you look at local needs i'm sure they're looking at it is is mainly on prevention and and yes, trying to get yeah. people off of the the opioid yeah. and out of the, but not so much on the issues that 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 crisis has caused so you have like the the child welfare issue that's going on right now, none of that money will go to help correct that. That's going to have to come out of the state coffers to try to fix this situation until it levels back out, and hopefully we don't have 6,000 kids in the system anymore. But, Mike, we keep hearing that there's sufficient money in the state coffers. I'm not sure the money is going to the uh, the DHHR in its aspect. Some of it's going there. Sure. But is enough going there to, make, uh, to address the problem that Larry's been – uh, speaking to for the last several weeks? I, I think enough will go there to address the issues that DHHR commissioners are bringing up now. This is, these are the solutions. This is how to solve this issue that we think best. Um, I think there will be appropriations to help in that area. Um, but we also want to see efficiencies found within the DHHR now that there's been a split up so that, again, we're not just throwing money at a situation. Um, when they did present these solutions, one of my first questions is, there a fiscal note with these solutions? And the answer was no. So I don't even know how much this is going to cost right now, these solutions, if we implement all of them. Comes back to you, Joe Ferretti. Well, a couple points. Uh, first of all, speaking about the, the SNAP and TAMP benefits, uh, remember it was three or four years ago where the legislature uh, looked critically at the recipients of those benefits. They found a few families that had used the money to go to Disney World. So they, they really tightened up the requirements that you had to meet in order to be eligible for those benefits. And right now, West Virginia has some of the strictest requirements in the country to receive those benefits. 
And what we have to understand is that, yeah, while there's, there's some people who abuse those benefits, and you hate to see that, and, and they should be uh, found out, and, and, and they should be then, uh, you know, the, some sort of uh, penalty should be applied to those folks. But these have real-world consequences. And when some of these families are denied money because the, the, uh, the father or the, or the mother don't meet the requirements to receive those benefits, the family suffers. And, and then so child poverty rates in this state, when we're celebrating economic development, at the same time, the child poverty rates are increasing in this state. So something's amiss there, and I think we need to look at that. Uh, Mike Carl's point about, well, you know, the way to get out of this problem is just to create uh, better economic conditions so more people can have jobs and be productive and have money coming into their household. I get that, and I, I agree with that. But we have to also understand that when we talk about tax relief to the citizens of the state, everybody enjoys a tax cut, but there are ways to target some of those tax cuts so that money go to the most needy. And I'm talking about child tax credits and earned income tax credits that the state should seriously look at so that some of these poorer families can really reap the benefits of tax cuts. And I, we're, 14 states in this country have child tax credits. West Virginia is not one of them. And I think to solve some of this problem on the front end, as a matter of public policy, the legislature has to look at that issue and decide if that's one way to cut taxes in the state. I think if we can get more money flowing into some of these poor families, uh, we'll deal with what the American Academy of, Academy of Pediatrics uh, pediatricians say, which is there's a direct correlation between financial insecurity and child neglect. And, and that's a way to deal with it on the front end is to make sure that some of these resources are getting to those who can most use them. Well, since you brought up my my perspective, uh, I will point out that the Fair 55 plan uh, replaces the income tax generally with, with, a, with a consumption tax, but it's called the Fair 55 plan because it reduces the rate for low-income people. Uh, in terms of what they, the rate they pay on consumption, so so that 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 that, that confirms the, uh, the merit yeah. of of the Fair Fifty Five plan, what you just called for. And isn't I would agree with it. Isn't part of our problem also um, West Virginia's status as what I call an import export state, where we import sixty five year olds and we export twenty two year olds, <laughs> <laughs> and we spend money to educate. Uh, our students at WVU, and a pretty big number of them, never come back to West Virginia again for a minute, except to visit mom and dad at Christmas. My only, um, the only one of my three children that went to WVU is working there now. The other three, or the other two, are out of state. Went to out of state schools, and they're living and working out of state. And and it's it's amazing. I mean, it it's good for realtors to bring those 65 year old people in from the suburbs of DC who sell their, their home for three quarters of a million dollars, buy a better house for 500,000 here, put the other 250 in their retirement. But what I've noticed in living in Morgan County where this goes on all the time, a lot is there comes a point when those 65 year olds are 85 and all their specialists who can really treat their illnesses and problems are in Washington. And so th there's something else going to be needed uh, as a way of getting them down to the specialists. Yeah, I, I, don't, um, I don't disagree with a lot of what you're saying, Larry. <laughs> that, that is absolutely going on. But I'm going to push back on Joe a little bit and say that tax credits are not tax cuts. You have to pay taxes before you can enjoy a tax cut. So what you're proposing right now is taking taxes from somebody else, redistributing to somebody else that hasn't paid taxes to begin with. Tax rate, oh, no, no, tax no, rate no. reductions are tax cuts, R right? But he was, if, if, he was if, talking if, about if, tax credits. If so, you qualify because of so a low child, income, a child tax credit is giving money to someone who didn't pay taxes to begin with. So that's not a tax cut for them. They weren't paying taxes. That's why the Fair Fifty Five plan works. <laughs> Uh, Bill, before we break, would you like to speak up for the 85-year-olds that Larry just talked about? I, 
<laughs> Larry's on target. He knows he's not there yet, but he will be there. <laughs> Counting the days, Bill. All right, Joe, good job starting us off, as always, as the leadoff hitter. Good morning, Rob. Uh, one of our objectives with the issue is to uh, present something that's going to invoke a he not or an engaged debate uh joe ferretti is gifted with this uh i'm not sure that my topic is going to do it i hope it does but i'm reminded of my topic i'm reminded of the old 1920 1930 uh grade b movies where the the guy in the quicksand sinking deeper and deeper frailing his arms every which way but nothing accomplished he eventually sinks and goes below the surface never to be seen again is this a love story this is yeah. a love story yeah yeah but but my that least Leads into my uh, uh, my topic, and my topic is yes the speakership at the House of Representatives, right. and uh, there's so much dysfunctional, there's so much untrust or distrust. There's every it's like the guy with a big beard sinking down in the uh, uh, quicksand, yelling for help, and nobody's coming to help. Uh, Keep in mind that if the House of Representatives does not find a speaker, if something happens to the president and the vice president, then the president goes to Chuck Schumer, which I don't think any Republican <laughs> wants to see. Uh, so my question is to my group, who's going to be the next speaker? Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, Scalise did not make it. Jordan apparently does not make is not going to make it, even though he's doing a lot of uh, backroom pressuring, uh, uh, threatening to to uh, uh, primary verse members or threatening the, or some of the media, other folks are threatening people that don't, don't vote for him for dashly things happening to him. It's not a good situation at all. Is there a way out of it? And what's going to be the solution? Yeah, a couple of congressmen have reported death threats have been made to yep. them. One congressman said he got ejected, evicted from his uh, office space because the person who uh, controls the building doesn't like the way he's been voting, so he's yeah. kicking him out. <laughs> uh, this is getting to be quite fascinating yeah. here. Uh, let's start first here with uh, uh, Joe Ferretti on the phone. Joe? Well, I, I, who's going to be the next speaker? Uh, I, who the heck knows? I, I don't see the Republicans coalescing around one candidate right now. And uh, so we're left with this, this quagmire. I think there's a, a, a potential solution out there, and I think it would be a good jujitsu move for the Republicans to do this. They need th this problem solvers caucus that exists, which is a coalition of both Republicans and Democrats in, in, in the House. I think the Republican members have to get a candidate, take that name over to the Democrats and say, can some of you people please vote for this person? And do it in a public way so that the Democrats have pressure on them to either go along with this plan or be another uh, bunch of sand in the gears here as far as Congress goes and, and, and the functions that we so desperately need to be uh, happening right now. So I would say to the Republicans, do it in a public way. Have the Democrats have to make a choice as to whether there's a candidate that, that some of them can vote for so that the, that person can get a majority of the votes and become speaker. Uh, I, that's the only way out that I see right now, because it, clearly the Republicans on their own can't solve this problem. Mike Height. Uh, I would agree, Joe. It's a, that's an excellent idea. Um, now, whether or not you can get them to agree to do that, I, I don't know. Um, but another way to get them to pick a speaker very, very quickly and, and coalesce around one person is for something to happen to Biden. And you will see them coalesce really quick when when there's a threat of Chuck Schumer becoming the, the next person in line. I can guarantee you they would come to some kind of consensus almost <laughs> immediately, um, if not sooner. So, but Joe, I think you bring up a great point. Um, if you bring the Democrats into uh, the decision making um, and, and you do it in an open and transparent way, um, that could be the solution to this. Mr. Schultz. We, um, it goes without saying, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. The reason we have this problem is because the Republicans' margin in the House is so narrow. One or two people don't matter when you've got a 20-point, uh, uh, when you have a 20-point uh, advantage. And they don't, and so it's close. 
And uh, it's been close both ways over the past few years, and we never really seem to have this problem. But this hands power to the, you know, 10 or so loons uh, on the Republican side in the in the House who can say, um, you know, somebody send an anonymous text to so-and-so's wife to get him to vote for Jordan. And there's been some of this. I don't know if it was a congressman who did it, but somebody's doing it. And these women are getting, you know, spouses are getting um, anonymous text threatening the lives of their of their family. Um, that's way past the, the pale. It's driven by this tiny number of people. And I think Joe is on to something. We have to get a majority of reasonable-minded people to vote for a speaker who's not going to be a rock thrower. And if that means we have to substitute reasonable Democrats for unreasonable Republicans, let's get it done. We need a we need a country's uh, a legislature that functions in this country. Um, it's an awful lot of things that you need both houses of Congress to do. Um, declaring war, as I recall, is one of them. And uh, you know, if if we should end up in a in a, uh, a showdown with Mr. Putin. Um, we need to be able to move and move quickly and not have to have a two-month debate about whether the United States of America is prepared to defend itself. Well, I don't um, know that that's going to happen, and that's not what I was advocating when I said bring the Democrats in and elect a Democratic speaker. I don't think that'll never happen. Um, what you have to do is go to the Democrats and say, oh, I what agree. Republican would you support as speaker? Sure. And, and that could be the solution. But either way, we've got to be able to find a way to make the thing function Agreed. at some level. But the way Washington, uh, D.C. is right now, if you went to the Democrats and said, what Republican would you support? A bunch of Republicans wouldn't support that Republican. That's exactly right. That has been posed. Jordan has said that is a non-starter. We're not going to go with someone that the Democrats uh, would support. And that's one of the reasons we're in this impasse right now. Mike Carl. Well, th- th- that last statement... Uh, I don't agree with. I think I think the majority of the majority, you know, not the nutcases that are holding things up, uh, would uh, welcome and recognize the importance of of democratic support for the speaker. That is the point, and I'm going to do my little part uh, as a you know longtime Republican uh, advocate and believer to say about. These nutcases that are that are blocking the functioning of government, you are irresponsible and selfish because, and you you haven't convinced me of serious pro Republican policy support, and in fact your action and what you're doing is antagonistic to pro Republican policy support. I think if you're the Democrats. You just keep letting the Republicans sink into the quicksand, Bill, because you're on such a short turnaround election cycle as a member of the House of Representatives. Your primary goal is to get power back in the House, and helping the Republicans out isn't the way to do it. Well, we've got to compromise. Uh, By the middle of November, if we have not addressed the continuing resolution, we're seeing bad, bad, bad things happen. They have to compromise some way. And but I but Jordan's own record of saying he did not want to do anything that would make the uh, that would make the Democrats happy. Uh, The other thing that Larry mentioned earlier about the problem is such a uh, narrow majority. Uh, We have the same thing in the Senate. The Senate had found a way to work around this. The Senate did some uh, power sharing, and it's worked very well. Both sides have been happy. There has been a reluctance on the part of the House to do that. And uh, But we're getting – We can. I heard a comment made yesterday. Uh, we're not suffering. We're not suffering uh, with this impasse. I think we are suffering in a lot of ways that's not – apparent now but give another 10 15 days it's going to be very obvious to everybody how much we're suffering and and i think also that you you mentioned it's not good strategy for the democrats you're right but that's why you have to make this transparent you have to have them out in the open too saying no we're never going to vote for a republican because that doesn't help them If if they look like part of the problem then it their strategy fails so they also have to i think they could they could become the heroes and look like the solution 
to the problem right now if they were willing to vote for a, a speaker like Scalise, maybe. If you could come out and support a Scalise, and there's enough people on the Republican side that would support him, there's enough people on the Democrats support him, and there's the votes you need. Jeffers has actually said there are several they would vote. They also that vote for the Democrats. Mm-hmm. He also said there were some they would never vote for, and Jordan is one. Jordan, yeah. yes. Yeah. I can't see how anyone could think that, oh, yeah, this guy who's never even sponsored a bill and the whole time he's been in the House has never done anything constructive at all. Yeah, that's the guy we want to run the entire Republican delegation in the House. Uh, Nobody thinks that. Even Jim Jordan knows (laughs) that he's not running in order to pass some legislative boatload of changes for America. He's just just a bomb thrower. He's just a an well, he, ar- I think anarchist. He's running to to control the group. He's not running for policy's sake. He's running to try to corral the cats. Is essentially the only reason he's running. And and he is. I think he is a strong leader, and he could corral the cats, and especially the ones on the far right. So I think that's the only reason he's running right now is is to be because you need strong leadership, and he's probably the strongest of the bunch right he now. He can corral the cats on the far right. Yes. He, he's having trouble corral, uh, corralling the cats in the middle. I agree. And on that, we move on to issue number three and the Sarge, the Badger, Delegate Mike Height. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with sort of a, <clears throat> a local um, – issue and that's that donald trump has come out and endorsed jim justice for a uh, senator and my question is 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 that the end of the mooney campaign because i was hoping for a close race in this i was hoping for good debates <clears throat> i was hoping for a close race and a, a competitive race and with trump coming out and supporting jim justice I don't know that we're going to get that now. So what's your opinion of the Jim Justice um, endorsement? Mike? Carl? Well, it, 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 I don't know if it absolutely concludes the competition, but it certainly makes it next impossible for, for Mooney to make it. So, so I, 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 I really think that, uh, uh, you know, it's – Somewhat self-serving too, because uh, ju- you know, uh, justice is he need he needs to distract from his <laughs> his own problems, and uh, I, I'm I'm very uh, uh, unhappy with the choices we have for U.S. Senate uh, in the Republican Party today. Does the justice endorsement mean anything? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, by Trump. A Trump endorsement. I'm sorry. Does Trump endorsement mean anything to the oh, oh, West Virginia? Oh, oh absolutely. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. I, I, but I, I, I just meant to say it's not quite conclusive, mm-hmm. but it's it's a big deal. But but if if something happens in Trump's world, <laughs> which he has a few things going on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, th- then that waters down the endorsement. Billy. Yeah. One of the reasons given that uh, that Trump endorsed justice because Mooney had made a very hard court play for Trump's endorsement uh, because I both I think both parties realized it was very critical to get Trump's endorsement. But one of the reasons given was that uh, Mooney's uh, funding from a PAC super PAC is this club for growth. Uh, the Club for Growth supposedly is putting as much as $10 million in his campaign during the cycle. But Club for Growth also has been promoting anti-Trump candidates. And uh, and this, you, I think we all realize that what we've seen in the media, uh, that Trump wants 100% loyalty from everybody that supports him. And the fact that this funding for Mooney is working against Trump. I think it made it fairly easy for Trump to go with uh, with, uh, uh, with justice. But going back to your basic question, uh, I think it's, it was a, I think justice had the upper hand anyway. Uh, uh, it's going to just move the scale, but it's going to move the scale farther, farther in justice favor, and it's going to make Mooney's effort to, to win in the primary even more difficult. Larry? Trump uh, never does anything uh, (laughs) self-sacrificial. Never does anything where he gives up something. 
He always does it to favor himself. And it could be something as simple as Jim Justice has run twice in front of all of the people in West Virginia in a general election and won. Well, a guy who's been stuck in one congressional district this whole time is not going to be able to make up that gap. So I think Trump is more than trying to control West Virginia politics, just picking the guy who he thinks has a much better shot of winning. Um, and that will turn out to be so. There will be a lot of people in other parts of the state who barely know who Mooney is. Wouldn't be able to pick him out of a lineup. Uh, but they know who Trump is. And if Trump told them to vote against Mooney, they'll go ahead and do it. So. Joe? Well, no less an authority than David McKinley will tell you that an association with Trump can can make a difference in a, in a West Virginia race. Uh and, and Mooney had that association in the second congressional uh, battle with McKinley. He doesn't have it now. And, and to me, I, I think this is just another nail in the coffin, because when the top Republican in your state, and that is Shelley Moore Capito, when she gets behind justice, you know there's a problem for Mooney. And now you have, uh, of course, Mitch McConnell, we know all along, uh, he was instrumental in getting justice to run. And so you got the Senate uh, Republican Committee behind uh, justice. And now you have Donald Trump. So I think uh, this is quite a hill for Mooney to climb at this point. Uh, statements coming out of his campaign indicate that, you know, he's not going to give up the ghost. He's still going to fight and he's the true conservative and all that. But I, I think that message is soon going to be lost when uh, it's not conservatism so much as the association with Trump. It's going to make a difference in that race. But I think that's just a, another nail in the coffin for Mooney because I think the forces were, were lining up behind justice, and, and polling showed he was up significantly statewide. So it seems to be uh, Governor Justice's race to lose. So was was Club for Growth the ultimate reason why Trump decided to get in this? Because he had said he was going to be neutral on it for a while. I have no idea what was the ultimate reason, but that is one of the reasons that's been cited right now. Whether it was a determined reason or not, uh, but it was one of the reasons. I, I was somewhat surprised by his endorsement because I think Mooney was that loyal soldier um, for Trump for years. While, while Trump was the president, he voted his way the majority of the time. He was a loyal soldier, um, and more so than, than justice. So if this comes down to the club for growth, I, you know— I, I feel bad for Mooney because being the loyal soldier, I would have thought he would have gotten the endorsement. So if this comes down to the club for growth, what other candidates within the state of West Virginia are going to fall by the wayside because um, the club for growth has donated to them? And now Trump may come out and support uh, candidates in other races. Uh, um, Club for Growth may be supporting a lot of candidates, but not to the scale that they were supporting Mooney. They were the group that came out first with a lot of money, $10 million I, I've heard earlier. Uh, that's uh, I don't think any other candidate is getting anywhere close to that amount of money. You know, there were a lot of people in that trail who were loyal to Trump and didn't get the same back. Uh, and that, that, list is, that list is growing. Yeah. Right. I have a relative that falls into that category. Right. So he's just the latest one in a long line. But uh, I still say don't count out Alex Mooney because justice has an awful lot of negatives that can be pointed out in mailers that will fill mailboxes around this state for <laughs> the next year. And he's, Alex has demonstrated his willingness uh, oh, to yeah. go negative and yep. to go negative in a big way. Well, but is it, is it negative basis. to point out facts? Well, I mean, if I said to put a mailer in your mailbox that says, it, listen, this guy has 87 lawsuits <laughs> against him. Yeah. He's getting helicopters repossessed. Is that negative? Yeah, you're, you're right. But it's also hatch framed. Yeah. Uh, you can take the same issue and frame it a couple of different ways. And we've counted out Mooney before, and, and yeah. he's risen from the ashes. So I wouldn't count him out yet either. Right, But it's, go, it's going to be an interesting campaign because everything that Jim Justice has done that does not fit conservative Republican is going to be in, in the mailbox, and it's going to be in there multiple times. And also, most of the flyers will be delivered by helicopter. 
<laughs> a it repossessed would, would, one. Wouldn't that be ironic? A repossessed helicopter. That's right. Yeah. Wouldn't that be ironic? <laughs> that, that they can't find. <laughs> yeah. Joe, do you have a final thought or anything on your end before we uh, go back to Bill for a final word? No, I, I, I just think that uh, Alex Mooney has, a, in terms of statewide name recognition and all these other issues that are coming up in the campaign, he's got a lot of work ahead of him. Hundred percent, but he, we know he's not afraid to do it. Bill, it's thought. actually Mike's the subject. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Mike, that, go ahead. Yep, I, I already said my my final word. We're In good. that case, then we move on to the break. Now we move on to Mr. Lawrence Schultz with issue number four, as he frantically tries to boot up his <laughs> smartphone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Moderate Republicans have referred to the extremists who seemingly have a death grip on the House at this time as a quote clown show end quote. Will this soon become an insult to clowns, or is it already? <laughs> each week. I don't know how he does it, but each week. Every single week. All right, Bill, what do you think? Clown shows. <laughs> He's already insulted He's you twice today. He's already insulted me, yeah. He, he, he talked about uh, uh, those, us mid-80 guys, and we need to be protected, yeah. Uh, I think it is a, uh, a clown show. Uh, I'm not sure... Uh, that's the politest way to to label it. I would call it another type of show, uh, but it's uh, but it's still it's, but it is but not suitable for radio. Yeah, yeah, unsuitable for radio. This is like yeah. when your granddad swears in front of you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But the question to me is, how is it going to affect uh, impact the Republicans in 2024? Uh, it has the possibility of doing what many folks say, demonstrating that the Republicans cannot govern. Uh, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But that's the image that's been projected. And that's the image we talked in the last segment of advertising, someone picking up a flaw and just uh, 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 capitalizing on it. That's going to be the flaw, one of the flaws in 2024. You're going to see a lot of people in their mailers, their advertising, their speeches referring to the so-called clown show or another type of show. I think it will have an impact on 2024. And the other thing on this, I've been watching some of the uh, uh, the ads in in northern Virginia, and admittedly that is kind of a unique position. But surprisingly, the number of folks that are using abortion and the MAGA uh, uh, races as, as a labeling, the number of uh, races that are reflecting those two surprises me. Maybe it shouldn't, but it does. A lot of folks are buying into this. And I think the clown show is going to be another one they use. Mr. Carl. Well, I... Uh I think it would be an insult to clowns. <laughs> uh, it's it's serious. It's 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 threatening to not only just the political future of the Republican Party, but to the, the you know the stability of the United States of America, particularly with these you know uh, you know international threats and national security at issue. A lot going on. And 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 so uh, I I I think it uh, clown show is not. Uh, uh, strong enough uh, uh, description of of the disaster that the psycho uh, m uh, m minority who call themselves Republicans and are killing Republican p policy are up to. Well, Bill did offer an alternative if yeah. you wanted to quote Bill. <laughs> yeah, let me. Let me the Facebook Jason Barrett just posted. This is a clown question. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. I, I've always been pretty good at recognizing clowns, and they're you know sometimes they're very well organized, Jason. <laughs> like for example, so many of them can get in a little tiny car and drive around. I've never seen Jim Jordan. Before. <laughs> I will say this: uh, this is an insult to clowns everywhere, unless you're talking about the clown from it, um, oh. which it most resembles. Um, this is a clown show, um, and and Jason's right too. Clown question, but you know uh, we have to address it. Um, the the Congress at the federal level right now is in total disarray, um, and you know they need to be referred to in in a negative connotation. So clown show, whatever show, um, <laughs> it's it's a mess right now, and uh, they better find a way to get it fixed. Mr. Ferretti. 
Well, I, I'm just amazed at the cavalier attitude that the members in Congress have to the damage they're doing to the country. And I look at it from two aspects. One, uh, a singular missile can fly out of Iran and into Israel, and we would be in a full-scale war in the Middle East. That's all it would take. And yet these folks want to dither in Congress and with their petty games and run to the Internet and raise money. And the second thing that, that strikes me is that they'll come to the microphones and say, oh, yeah, I've gotten death threats because I didn't support Jim Jordan or I, I've been threatened this way or that way. I think we need to take, take a step back and understand what's happening in this country and how people are getting triggered. And, and I, I know this is a loose uh, tie here, but I'm going to make it. Uh, a circuit court judge last night was gunned down in his driveway in Hagerstown. Now, the investigation is going on, and, and, and who knows what's behind that kind of that heinous act of killing a circuit court judge in his own home. But I, I got to believe that, it, it, in part, it could be somebody's upset with the civil or criminal justice system. And if that's the case, that's just one small example of where we are as a country. And we better wake up and understand that the game playing and the Internet fundraising has to stop. And governance has to start. And too many people in this country are now getting triggered, and too many people are at risk. You know, it was Steve Scalise who was shot playing softball in the, in the district. Does it not resonate with him that perhaps we need to get serious about what we're doing in terms of managing this country and, 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 and our politics and our government? Uh, these folks need to wake up. And I, for one, am concerned that uh, this is going to continue, this spectacle, for some time because we're lacking serious people. And, and I think we all should be concerned because it's getting dangerous out there, folks, and, and I think we better realize it soon. Joe, your point's a great one. It's one I'm sure everybody in this room has considered as well. Uh, and I think it is also uh, a point the American people will be considering strongly uh, because right now I'm sure – there are a lot of folks who regret that they turned control over the Congress to Republicans right now, or at least this group of Republicans. And as I said, with Congress, the election cycle is such a short turnaround, it's difficult to forget things like this. So if you're a person in the middle, a moderate, and you vote elections not based on party, but who you think is the better candidate, and there is a, a, a decent middle ground in this country, and you go to the ballot box and you think, do I really want to put this group back in charge of serious world problems? I think you're going to have to give it some serious consideration this time around. Whereas maybe before you'd have said, well, if I vote for this guy, at least I know he won't raise my taxes. And maybe that was your reason for voting that way. Will that be enough to overcome what's going on right now with this group? I don't know if it will be next time. Now, a year from now is a long time. People may forget. They may move on. But I don't know. There's some serious stuff. As Joe said, it's a dangerous world out there, Michael. I, I hope I hope that principle applies in the primary for the reelection of these nuts. Well, I, I don't. I, that's the problem I, with I, primaries, I, right? I, well, yeah, it pushes you further to one edge. Yeah. Well, but 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 uh, the, the I think the voters, you know, who who have the right to vote, agree would agree with me. That the particular individuals, the you know the minority of the man, of the majority, uh, are hurting the country and hurting the party, and would vote for an opponent to uh, re-election of but, those. But Mike Rob's making a great point. Of his uh, the vast majority of the time, if someone's primary, they are primary to the more extreme than the person that's in the house. Uh, th th there's absolutely no statistics supporting that. Yes, it that. is. There's a lot of statistics on that one. Uh, well, what's extreme to you is uh, and, and the problem good is, for America. The, for the other main. problem is if, if you're one of those far-right people, the, then the solution when it comes election time to you is to elect more far-right people than we've elected previously and if you're a moderate the the solution is we need to get rid of them and, and elect more moderates so there's still going to be the battle there it's just going to be how do you how do you get to the, the the voters and convince them that your your way is the right way but but mike in primaries it's generally the base that carries the day the, the, and the base is one that is going to primary someone that's more extreme than the incumbent this hor this horrible 
action of these, you know, this small group of agitators in the House uh, are, 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 are not uh, uh, the re, do not reflect the Republican voters, all of whom are eligible to vote in the primaries. But do they? And I think one of the other litmus tests is, at least for me, when I'm voting for somebody, is did you keep your word? Did Did you tell me you were going to do something and then keep your word? And when it comes to these these radical right individuals, all of them agreed to go into a caucus and and place a vote, and whoever got the most votes, they would back once they got to the floor, and they went back on their word because their guy didn't get enough votes. So to all of those radical right people that went back on their word, that's the litmus test for me. You didn't hold up to your word. And Mike and I agree with that. Unfor- this is where Mike Carl and I disagree. <laughs> Unfortunately, during, uh, at the primary level, they tend to tend to vote more extreme. But when, but, but when the candidate has caused such a crisis, the turnout at the primary will be much larger. And I agree with Mike uh, that that'll be the analysis, and that's why I think there's a chance that the incumbent uh, radical will be beaten. I, I believe I the best right. chance for that to happen will be on the day, if it ever comes, when moderate Republican leaders in individual states containing uh, Congress uh, representatives who are part of this caucus, of this tiny caucus of trouble, um, actually step forward and criticize them like Mr. Carl has done here today. We're going to see whether that courage is there. And if that's not there, then I think we're going to see more of the same. But um, hopefully there will be some reasonable people who step forward and say, look, forget the party labels for a minute. we got to cut this out. Um, we got to quit uh, refusing to govern, <laughs> and, and, which is kind of where we are now. And I hope there's not some national disaster. I, I don't mean weather, I mean political disaster, governmental disaster that that stimulates that uh, recognition. All right, for that we now move on to issue number five and Mr. Carl. Well, I want to uh, uh, go back to the top level, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and before uh, before I throw out my question, uh, I, I want to show how objective I am. <laughs> Uh, we all know your objectivity. There's no need to. I, 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 wa- I watched Biden's speech last night, and I thought he did a decent job. You know, he he actually mentioned Iran's involvement. He didn't go too strong, but but uh, it, you know, he had an agenda to connect uh, Ukraine support and and uh, Israel support. But my question is: uh, Is there any active? candidate for president on either side, you know, that's talking and, you know, got got a campaign going, uh, who's less qualified than Joe Biden. Well, you said you were impartial, <laughs> unbiased. See, see, uh, well, he was just laying the he was laying the platform earlier. He was, he was laying something. Just putting a ramp up to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let's start with Bill Stubblefield. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and hit that one. Uh, thanks, Mike. <laughs> it's okay. uh, I would like to see better candidates running for president than what we have on both parties. Uh, I think Joe Biden, uh, I think he's a nice guy, is as effective as I would like to see him. No, but, I'm not, but I, and I think a lot of his perception of him, that he's not going to be able to change the fact he's old, the fact that he's, uh, he's not sharp as he would like to be or has been in the past. But going back to your basic question, is there anyone less qualified than Biden? Uh, I think easy. Donald Trump's less qualified than Biden. Well, from my view, he, because uh, Donald Trump frightens me, uh, Biden does not. To to that list, I would add Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis. Um, I would like to hear Bill Stubblefield say that sentence. Uh, Good, Bill <laughs> Ramaswamy. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ramaswamy. What, what do you mean, Rob? Come on, he I, rehearses I, that I, every I, day. I, He's I go been to begging bed. for you to ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your confidence, Rob. I am impressed. I am impressed. As am I. I you know, I, to me, um, 
all the talk about Joe Biden's uh, failing sort of uh, cognitive abilities that we hear always seem to leave out the speech uh, Mr. Trump gave a few <laughs> a few weeks ago in which he was talking about how the windmills are killing the whales when in fact what he had done has been briefed about a problem in Wales, the country of Wales, <laughs> with <laughs> with windmills. Okay, when Joe Biden starts doing that, when he when he can't even understand W H A L E S versus W A L E S, then get back to me. <laughs> I'm not worried about that, Larry. That's just prep issues. That's nothing more than blaming the people working on this campaign for giving them bad intel. <laughs> <laughs> They're killing whales. They're killing whales. Oh, Joe Ferretti. <laughs> um, well, I answered Mike's question last night in a text. I, I, I believe uh, now that there's been, uh, well, with Fannie Willis down here in Georgia, indicted 18 people regarding the uh, efforts to overturn the Georgia election results. A lot of people wondered, how is she going to do that? How is she going to manage that? 18 people are indicted and charged with basically the same criminal behavior. Well, what she was doing, folks, was setting up a whole litany of plea bargains, which we now see developing here in Georgia. Everybody's running for the exits, figuring, how do I get out of this so I don't do jail time? And now what she's going to have are a bunch of state witnesses which is part of the plea bargain process, you agree to testify and you agree to acknowledge certain facts about not only your involvement in the criminal behavior, but others' involvement. And what she has done is set this up to where the, the blame for the behaviors that took place here in the state of Georgia are going to run directly to the White House and to the Trump campaign folks. And when that happens, I have to believe that Donald Trump would be the most unqualified individual to serve as president. Mr. Height. Um, so I, I disagree wholeheartedly. As much as I dislike Trump, he's not the least qualified person um, in this race. And nor is Biden. I know, Mike, you, you want to hear me say Biden, but I can't. Um, Ramaswamy. What the hell has he done? Okay, what makes him qualified to be president? I could say the say, same thing about JFK or uh, RFK Jr. What the heck has he done to be qualified for president? Neither one of them are qualified to be president. They both sound like idiots when they speak, almost as much as Trump does. But Trump has been president. He knows what it takes to be president. He had good policies. He just didn't know when to shut his mouth. So is he qualified? Yeah, he's qualified much more than some of the other candidates. So I don't know why we're talking about Trump um, when you have people like Ramaswamy out there who, <laughs> who has no business being in this race. I think this panel just likes to say Ramaswamy, hoping that Bill's going to get involved at some point. <laughs> He's on a roll today, Larry. <laughs> Mike Carl comes back to you for the final point. Well, uh, I, I, have you changed? Has the panel changed your mind? Uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I know. I know you went into this open minded. No, 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 the, the Ramaswamy thing, but even he's not as bad as Biden, and so. Uh, and and I, you know, respect and certainly agree with your Mike's comments on on Trump. Um, uh, Trump's made you know he's he's done some he's done some things wrong and certainly he's got a lot of problems. And I'm personally rooting for one of the other Republicans to uh, uh, get the nomination. But if he's the nominee, uh, I and Biden is his opponent. I'm supporting Trump. Or a third party, which has yet to emerge. You're saying you would support a third party possibly, uh, not Mike Carl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not Mike Carl. Yeah. Correct? Uh, that's exactly. You would possibly support a third party. I'm not going to speak party. for Mike, uh, right. but I am intrigued in what might emerge from the third party for this very reason. The American public do not want either Biden or Trump as uh, uh to be to be on the ticket you, they're looking for an alternative do you have a name that you would support 
Well, I'm I'm going to be intrigued to see what happens with Unity or the No Labels Party. Uh, Joe Manchin's name has been mentioned, <laughs> but recently the Unity Party says the Republican will have top billing and the Democrat will be the vice president. Uh, I'm not sure Joe Manchin would accept that. So I don't know if Manchin, if that takes Manchin out of the consideration or not. But folks like Larry Hogan uh, are mentioned. Uh, there are some good people that are more middle of the road, more moderate, and and you can blame the extremes on a lot of things. Jerry Mannion's one. But my sense is the American people are looking for something, someone more in the middle that can uh, can speak to both sides not and not the extremes, a more moderate. And I think the No Labels Party by design or the Unity Party by design uh, may provide that. But it's too early. We won't know until January, the very earliest, if they're even going to field a um, a fill. One thing they have been making progress is getting access to all the states. Uh, RFK Jr. is having trouble now, and something I thought earlier that the biggest challenge getting on the state ticket was getting signatures. They say that's the that's the easiest of all aspects. Once they get the signatures, then they go to the state and ask petition be on, and then the established parties come up with objections. The established parties come up for the reasons they should not be allowed. And that's a real nut to crack in getting RFK Jr., No Labels, or Cornell West, any of these folks, only as an independent. Mr. Ferretti, I want to come back to you because we've got about two minutes left and uh, see if there was another issue you wanted to bring up here at the end. Well, yeah, real quickly, we can go around the room. Uh, is it too early to be thinking about the statutory remedies available uh, for removal of our sheriff in light of these uh, indictments that were handed down this week. Uh, West Virginia Code 667 allows either the prosecuting attorney or county commission to bring forth a petition for removal or a uh, uh, petition from the citizens of the uh, county can uh, be brought forth uh, for removal. Is it too early to be thinking about that? Joe, uh, another question with that. Uh, the fact he's been charged with misdemeanors and not a felony, will that have any bearing on what might course of action might be taken? Yeah, I, I think I think that has to be part of the equation, is uh, the gravity of the offenses here. And the underlying uh, issue with his daughter was a misdemeanor also. So uh, I, I think that, that bears consideration, Bill. But uh, you know, these are pretty serious charges when you're, when you're uh, allegedly – lying to authorities about uh, your involvement in the investigation. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's trivial, and uh, I think the question could be fairly asked, uh, will this affect his ability to carry out his duties? You know, uh, that section of code also would allow a prosecuting attorney to remove county commissioners who are derelict in their duty in Jefferson County and should probably yep. be I examined um, in in that county as well. There was another but, meeting yesterday they failed to achieve quorum. On. Yes, but, absolutely. Yep. Um, but with respect to the sheriff, my personal opinion on that is he is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, and the prosecuting attorney should make no action until he is or isn't um, faced a, a, a trial and is either found guilty or not guilty. Mike, I think you're making a good point, but going back to Jefferson County Commission, they are in effect not breaking a law. A uh, county commissioner has to meet only an individual only one time every three months. Yes, but the, the prosecuting attorney can determine, because they've missed so many meetings, that they are derelict in their duties. And if he comes to that conclusion, he has within his rights to remove them from office.